Let me read to you a passage from the 8th chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, verses 1 to 3. It's the Gospel for Friday of the 24th week in Ordinary Time, Year 2. St. Luke writes, After this, Jesus travelled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Kudza, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. That's from Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. And what does it suggest to us? Well, there are many ways of looking at history. One can view it as the story of individuals. One can look on it as the drama of economic development, or again, as the rise and fall of kingdoms. It is certainly fascinating to follow the rise and fall of empires in human history, beginning perhaps from the Egyptian kingdoms, or the Persian, or the Greek, the Great Roman Empire, or whatever. Empires have risen that have brought many good things to mankind, while others have risen that have been nothing but disaster. The United States is the superpower of our day, but the lesson of history is that it will eventually decline and be overtaken by others. It could be that India and China will be the powers of some day to come. Well, let us look at the beginnings of another kingdom. Unlike all others in history, this one was promised in advance by God himself. He revealed to his chosen people that this kingdom would come. And for centuries the people held themselves in expectation. Expectation of the coming kingdom. A Messiah would be sent and he would establish the kingdom and that kingdom would be the rule of God himself, no less. This kingdom would last not for a time but forever and it would be a kingdom of definitive benefits for all the world. John the Baptist appeared, a great prophet, asking all to get ready, for God's kingdom was near. And then, at least to some, he pointed Jesus out as the promised one who would take away the sin of the world. He himself, he said, was not worthy to undo his sandal straps. He would baptize with the Holy Spirit. In our Gospel today, we see our Lord travelling about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was very near. In fact, it was present in his very person. And, as he would reveal to his disciples, its blessings would become available through his passion, his death and his resurrection. That kingdom consisted in union with him and in receiving a share in his own life and living accordingly. But let us notice here a striking feature, the diversity of those whom he called and who shared in his saving mission. We read that the twelve were with him and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Kudza, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. That's what we read. One would have thought that anyone seeking to establish a long-lasting kingdom, indeed one that would triumph over all others, and which would be eternal, would select the most outstanding of persons to assist. It is said, for instance, that 
very much part of the military success of Alexander the Great and Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte, was their choice of generals. What strikes one about the choice by Christ of those who were to associate most closely with him was their, let us say, ordinariness. The apostles consisted of fishermen, a tax collector, probably a political partisan or two, Simon the Zealot, and perhaps Judas Iscariot too, and others. That they were truly religious is clear, but how like the average man they seem to have been. Consider the women who also associated with our Lord and the Twelve. One was drawn even from Herod's household. There was Mary Magdalene, from whom our Lord had cast out several demons, and Susanna and several others. The point is that we could look on the travelling band with Jesus in their midst and at their head as a microcosm of the whole family of man. They were the beginning of a vast concourse which God in his plan means to call to himself. It is a reminder of what our Lord would ask of his disciples before ascending into heaven. They were to go to the whole world and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the commands he had given to them. Our Lord's diverse travelling band, as described in today's Gospel that I read, reminds us that all are called to life in Him and to a full share in His holiness. We are all called to personal sanctity and to a generous share in His mission, His mission of bringing the whole human race to the knowledge and love of Jesus Christ. In Him is to be found salvation for man. He is the only divinely appointed way to the Father. Let us in prayer and in spirit place ourselves in the midst of this travelling community, all united in love with Jesus. It is a picture of the church in miniature, the church in embryo, before receiving the gift of the Spirit of God following our Lord's resurrection. It is a picture of the future church of which we are members by faith and baptism. It points to the universal call to holiness in Christ and to redemption and sanctification of all in Him. So then, let us respond wholeheartedly to this divine plan.